and an honor to be here uh, uh, and to speak on a very important subject uh, uh, at the site where much of uh, it uh, happened. And, uh, so, uh, yeah, you, you introduced my, my affiliations and projects, so I don't actually mention them at all. Uh, and I have my background in political science, and, uh, uh, which means I'm not a historian looking at these uh, cases. But I will uh, I will make, give a, uh, well, make an attempt to put the Greek case in, a, from its Canadian point of view in a, in a longer historical time frame or perspective. So we will start long before the Greek case and we will end uh, today, basically. Uh, so, uh, the Greek case has become sort of an epitome of Scandinavian international uh, activism and the exceptional role of Scandinavians in international affairs. So, when the Scandinavian governments and the Netherlands in 1967 filed this uh, uh, interstate complaint uh, over allegations of torture by the European Greece, the case was certainly <coughs> unique um, because it was the first time ever that states used interstate complaints uh, <coughs> mechanisms to protect the rights of citizens, not of their own state, but of another state. Uh, protecting the rights of the people of another state against its own government. Basically. And so commenters have suggested that the Scandinavian governments acted out of, and I quote here one of the texts on this um, quote, belief in human rights and a belief that it was their moral duty to act when the rights of fellow Europeans were being flagrantly violated. Uh, so, 
I will tell you a story quite quickly, and this is the agenda for my talk today. Uh, I will place it in the context of Scandinavian uh, exceptionalism. Uh, and I will then uh, uh, problematize the idea that Scandinavian states are somehow uh, inherently moral, cosmopolitans, and so on, and suggest a different reading of, of their engagement with the international human rights regime over the years. And I will walk you through three episodes. Uh, the first one being the the founding of the international human rights regime with a specific focus on the Council of Europe and the European Convention on Human Rights and how they acted when they ratified it. We will then look at the uh, period when they started being more activist in the foreign policies, uh, uh, including the Greek case, uh, and how they sought to protect themselves by the doctrine of dualism from uh, domestic repercussions of the international human rights regime. And finally, we will look at the uh, period from the 1980s and onward when the international human rights regime started having an impact on the scale of the states themselves and how governments then reacted to the uh, increasing uh, relevance in, in the list of policies. So this is the agenda for today. If you have something to add, I don't know. Uh, it's too late for that now, I guess. How can you say So we'll start, start with, with the idea of exceptionalism and the idea of uh, so, so the idea that, that the Scandinavian states in the Greek case, act, case acted out of, of a sense of human rights, of course, following duty, uh, seems to dovetail with other accounts of Scandinavian exceptions, where it's been said that the Scandinavian states um, pursue altruistic foreign policies. Sorry, it comes in the wrong here. Uh, they have, for instance, <coughs> been among the few states that meet the, the United Nations targets of, of 1% of, of GDP as foreign aid and so on. They have engaged in support during the Cold War for the federal immigration struggles against colonialism and against apartheid. They have uh, endorsed multilateralism in international law uh, and uh, engaged in peacekeeping and mediation efforts, etc. So there are many examples of this. And so, to some scholars uh, uh, that are very depressed by these seemingly altruistic international actions, they have called the Scandinavian states moral superpowers, agents of the world common good. Uh, global good Samaritans, or simply good states. And policymakers in the Scandinavian region have, of course, been, been very flattered and, and uh, have been willingly using these, uh, these epithets for themselves in, uh, to boost their international standing. Uh, and the question then in this issue is why, why are Scandinavian states so exceptional? So, if you, uh, why, would, why would explain their, their seemingly altruistic actions? And, uh, seeking to explain this, uh, this apparent exceptionalism, then researchers in public science and political science and international relations have uh, often pointed to the norms and values that are predominant, uh, supposedly, in, in domestic culture in the United States. So, Scandinavian societies are, uh, on this reading, then, characterized by notions of solidarity, justice, equality, social democracy, not the least, and the rule of law. And Scandinavian foreign policymakers, then, being, being uh, convinced and persuaded by these norms, uh, simply act on them internationally too. They extrapolate values that are dominant in domestic society and extend them to uh, all people everywhere in a cosmopolitan fashion. So, if domestic policies are based on strong norms of equal rights, policymakers simply extrapolate these values beyond national borders. Uh, yes, so, I mean, Scandinavian models might be either reflected or a bit embarrassed by these, these claims about Scandinavian states. Uh, and in this talk, I seek to put the Scandinavian states' role in the Greek case in a different perspective, um, in a different theoretical point of view. Uh, and I want to challenge the notion that Scandinavian governments are exceptionally committed to human rights due to some primordial Scandinavian utilitarian culture. So we'll pursue a thesis in my talk. Uh, and uh, when you pursue a theoretical thesis, it means that you also focus on some things and, and downplay others. So I will downplay domestic values and look instead at how governments have acted. So the culture of the council come with a number of, of, of analytical problems, but suffice it to say that it underestimates, underestimates, underestimates agency and political contestation. Uh, and since culture changes only very slowly, uh, it can't really help us explain variation over time or across cases. So for instance, why did the Scandinavian states confront the Greek government uh, in 1967, but not other authoritarian governments in Europe at the same time? Why were they more cautious with these some other regimes in Europe? So, culture is a, is a rather blunt analytical tool to understand. So, 
My approach will be a different one. Uh, starting from the notion that uh, so, so, sorry, I, I will look at how um, uh, Scandinavian states have engaged with the international human rights uh, uh, regime since its inception after World War II. And then the question that I, that I, that guides me through the talk is when, when faced with the questions of whether to create international human rights treaties, whether to ratify and incorporate them in domestic law, and whether to combine with the standards that human rights law set, uh, how have Scandinavian foreign policymakers reason? Uh, if the cultural minister account were true, we'd find Scandinavian states to sort of unquestionably support the expansion of the international human rights regime. We'd find, find them to willingly adjust domestic practices so as to comply with international human rights law obligations. But this turns out not always to have been the case. Uh, so we need a different account. And this is what I'm afraid to do with my talk today. Uh, I start from the simple notion that international human rights treaties. Uh, uh, create certain costs, we call them sovereignty costs in, in the theory of literature. The idea is that they constrain sovereign discretion. Governments can't act freely as they want, and that's the point of the international monetary. So they come at a cost for the government to sign, and ratify, and incorporate these conditions. Uh, and governments assess the costs of participating uh, in uh, international uh, human rights regime, uh, regimes, and international human rights treaties. The costs may vary, of course, over time. They may change due to external factors, such as when the international human rights law uh, institutions uh, gain authority, gain clarity, expand the membership with new states that have different preferences on international human rights, uh, or when it increases in terms of complexity. So that's the case when the, the, the costs sort of uh, expand uh, due to national changes. But they can also change the internal factors, factors that are internal to the states. So, uh, if the domestic institution setup changes, uh, the consequences of having ratified the international human rights treaty might change. So, for instance, if, if your courts used to be differential and never question uh, the uh, elected branches, uh, but then turn to become more independent and, and, and gain new judicial review powers, for instance, the costs of having treaties ratified and incorporated will increase because governments might then face consequences. Of and similarly, if groups in civil society will gain new opportunities for mobilizing to actually claim the rights that the states have uh, granted to them through uh, their ratification in their treaties, then governments will also face costs. And probably they also factor in this future potential cost that they can't really foresee into the decisions whether they ratify them. Uh, the third point is that different governments, of course, have different preferences on international human rights treaties. So, uh, they, governments of different color simply uh, assess the costs of participating in these regimes differently. Uh, so, for instance, uh, political parties uh, have different ideological preferences on rights related issues. So, take for instance the Conservatives in Sweden, which I will talk with more, more, a bit about, uh, about later. They are pro-property rights, they like the idea of judicial review, they want to see constitutional constraints on government, uh, partly out of ideology, partly out of tactics, because they've been in opposition more often than not during the 20th century, so they want to have means to constrain the government. Whereas if you're a social democrat, you might see things differently. You one might want to prefer a very strong uh, executive because you believe in the idea of parliamentary supremacy and you don't want courts and rights and constitutionalism to constrain what the government can do. So this is part of politics. It's ideology, it's tactics. Uh, another way in which government preferences are shaped uh, uh, on human rights uh, uh, treaties is through inter-ministry competition. So foreign ministries, for instance, uh, tend to... Uh, it's, it's their job, basically, to, to ensure that the state has good rep reputation internationally, so they like to ratify things. Whereas justice ministries, they're the ones who have to take care of the actual implementation of a ratified treaty, uh, and they tend to be very skeptical. So, depending on which ministry wins the day when the government uh, deliberates, uh, different preferences might follow. And this is something we see, especially in the Norwegian case, where the justice ministry has been a, a, a long time skeptic of 
ratifying, incorporating, even creating international refugees. Whereas the foreign ministry has been uh, very concerned with Norway's reputation standing in international society. Okay, so uh, the basic point is it's not about culture, it's about politics and constellation. So did I say that I am a political scientist? Uh, uh, that's the things we like to look at instead of cultural things. Uh, so okay, with this some slight theoretical setup, we'll move into the three different episodes that I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, starting with the founding and the ratification of the European Convention on Human Rights in the Spanish States. So when the when the Council of Europe was founded. Uh, the Scandinavian states were certainly key players, they were the, among the original founding members, but they were anything but enthusiastic about uh, the idea of creating a European human rights regime. Uh, I'm now walking through some debates uh, at the founding of the Council of Europe uh, and which positions the Scandinavian gov governments maintain, because it helps us to see uh, what sort of policies they pursued in the, the founding phase. So, uh, the starting point was the Congress of Hague in 1948, where Churchill calls this Congress uh, in Hague. This is Churchill in, in Strasbourg, but in, in 1948, in Hague, and this is the starting point for the European movement that wanted to see a federalist Europe, basically. And so, out of this Congress came a proposal to create a Council of Europe. Uh, the French wanted to be some, uh, have a, a parliamentary assembly, be supranational, whereas the British wanted to have a, make it a new government organization where the governments would have the final say and so the result was a compromise between federalists and sovereignists. And the Scandinavians reluctantly accepted the invitation to participate in founding the Council of Europe. They insisted that the Council of Europe should remain an intergovernmental organization uh, and the Scandinavian states and the United Kingdom together would toward the federalist ambitions which eventually prompted the states that sought a closer union uh, with supranational uh, uh, elements to initiate a parallel European integration project through the Treaty of Rome in 1957. So they managed to sort of derail the European project from the beginning. Uh, and in the founding years, the key issue was what the Council of Europe would actually do. So at this time, we had military and security cooperation in Western Europe, developing another venues through the NATO and so on. Uh, eventually, uh, what would come later. You had economic coordination coordinated through uh, the OEEC, the Organization for European Economic Cooperation. You had the United Nations that offered forums for cultural affairs and for human rights. So why, why would we need the Council of Europe? One thing that the Federalists of the European movement had succeeded in doing is to launch the idea of a convention and a court uh, for human rights as a foundation idea for the Council of Europe. And this would be the thing that remained, and it would become one of the key purposes of the Council of Europe. At the founding of the Council of Europe, the enthusiasm of the Consultative, uh, consultative Assembly, where representatives from national parliaments uh, deliberated, uh, and which was dominated by federalists from the European movement, their enthusiasm was curbed by the Governing Committee of Ministers, where governments uh, participated, and initially, uh, the committee even denied the assembly to even place the issue of human rights on its agenda. It was only after the intervention by Winston Churchill, I mean, the great victor from the Second World War, arriving in Strasbourg, giving this talk, uh, that the, the committee of ministers eventually allowed the assembly to even discuss the issue of human rights. Uh, so Sweden and Norway were among the sceptics here. They questioned they had a value of a European human rights convention. Uh, fearing that it would duplicate the work that was currently being done at the, uh, at the United Nations. Well, Denmark was a bit more appreciative and, and appreciated the fact that the European Commission, unlike the United Nations Declaration, could be made binding. Uh, um, and then they, the Assembly then adopted a draft convention of human rights and, and they also adopted another 38 recommendations that wanted to send to the Committee of Ministers and the Committee of Ministers uh, voted down on 38 recommendations, save for the one that proposed the Human Rights Commission. Uh, and they were, of course, not enthusiastic about the idea of the Human Rights Commission, but they could not totally dismiss it, as it would, be, as it would have been a very, I mean, a total embarrassment for the Council of Europe if it couldn't even conclude a treaty on human rights protection. Uh, and then the Committee of Ministers supported the Committee of Legal Experts, which uh, suggest two ways of, of writing uh, the Convention. 
either simply enumerating rights, expecting the member states to specify the rights, supported by the jurisprudence of an international court, so to leave it to the, to the, to the courts and the states to decide what these rights contain. Or the other alternative was to define them in detail, to define uh, permissible derogations and so on, and, and, and to specify them in a, in a hard a, a treaty of international law. And Sweden and Norway Denmark were among the states that preferred the Convention to be formulated as precisely and concretely as possible uh, in order to clarify state policy obligations. So the reason for favoring specificity here was not really to protect individual rights, but to protect, protect states' interests against one another. Because in their understanding, the Convention was primarily a tool for interstate complaints, uh, where they would fear to, be, to have other states using the Convention against them in national uh, and the next contentious issue then was the court and this jurisdiction. So there would be a court of some kind here. And the Scandinavian states belonged to the majority that opposed the proposal for a tribunal. They saw the need for a, for a court and they feared that the court might be used by subversive forces such as communist agitators. Remember, this, this is only two years after the uh, situation in Czechoslovakia and so on. I mean, this is really at the, 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 the the beginning of the, the First World War. Uh, so to solve this disagreement over whether to have a court or not, uh, Sweden came up with an individual solution to make the court's jurisdiction optional, so it wouldn't be compulsory on the state to write the convention. And the final, final contention this was the right of individual petition, and eventually this was made optional as well. So what we see here in the drafting phase uh, is that the United States were among the most skeptical to the whole idea of a supranational human rights review. They realized the costs that a supranational human rights system would entail for their domestic sovereign discretion and sought to prevent uh, and protect themselves against it. Right. So, uh, once the convention had been signed, uh, the next step is for to ratify it. Then all three Scandinavian states were among the first to ratify the European Convention of Human Rights. But the ways in which ratification was debated in national parliaments uh, also revealed how they carefully sought to limit the costs of participating and seek advantages from being a member of this, this convention. So, in Norway, the ratification debate was framed by concerns about the implementation mechanisms, and the Ministry of Justice advised against transferring authority to, international, to an international organ. The so government, government proposed a minimum ratification that didn't accept the court and didn't accept the uh, individual petition mechanism. Uh, but, uh, and they also made reservations on religious freedom. Uh, the Swedish government treated ratification as a pure foreign policy matter. They did not really require a thorough review and consultation process, so it was, was uh, not thoroughly debated in the Swedish parliament. Uh, no need to alter domestic legislation, and only afterwards some conservative politicians raised the issues whether, of, and the question of whether Sweden was really in compliance with the Convention that they just ratified. Uh, in Denmark, was a bit more thorough, so prepared the matter uh, by revising some provisions uh, in uh, the Social Security Act on administrative detention to ensure compliance, and then had two debates in Parliament. Uh, uh, and then we also accepted both the court and individual petition upon ratification. Uh, so the question is, why did Denmark combine themselves more strongly to the Convention than Sweden and uh, Norway did? Uh, and one reason has to do with foreign policy, because one of the dominant issues in Denmark at the time was uh, the, the, the Danish minority in the southern Schleswig region uh, in Germany. Uh, and the idea was that if we ratify the Convention, the court and the individual petition, uh, we will pressure Germany to do the same, and thereby we will protect the Danish minority in South Schleswig. Funnily, okay. no one realized that if Denmark uh, did this, Germany could also use the Convention to protect the German minority in, uh, on the other side of the border. But uh, this was one of the key issues at the time. Uh, so Denmark saw, sought foreign policy advantages by referring to uh, and there was not much that happened in Norway countries in, in, in the ratification phase, with one exception, it was that religious freedom was being enacted in Sweden and Norway, uh, thanks to this. So, uh, in, in, in Norway there was some, some uh, fierce debate on this issue, actually, because uh, the Norwegian constitution, in the second paragraph, stated that 
uh, Jesuits were not allowed to enter Norway. Uh, uh, and so uh, eventually Norway in 1956 withdrew its reservation from the article of the Convention that uh, granted religious freedom. Uh, and Sweden, uh, uh, when Red Fang accepted the petition and without time limit, as the first state of all, so that, that's a bit surprising maybe, but the government's reasoning was that uh, uh, it was risky to do so because uh, Sweden had not accepted the court and the implementation apparatus of the system was so weak, so it was not a great danger that Swedes could uh, turn to Strasbourg. Uh, another issue that, that was uh, uh, a bit problematic for, for Sweden no, was uh, uh, accepting the European Court of Human Rights jurisdiction. So both governments followed the policy of wait and see and weren't really eager to allow their citizens to file complaints with the Strasbourg Court. Only by the mid-60s did they finally accept the court. And one concern in Norway was that, that Nazi collaborators who had been sentenced in the post-war proceedings uh, would turn to Strasbourg to have their, their convictions overtried. So, so then, in the founding years, the Scandinavian states were far from enthusiastic about the emerging international human rights regime. They sought to ensure that the European regime would specify rights in detail. They sought to avoid activist interpretations, and they sought uh, to ensure that it would have a weak optional enforcement mechanism. On the other hand, we say that it was precisely this cautious, realist reluctance that allowed the system to come about and, and be created. It was precisely this that made the European Convention of Human Rights viable in the situation that was around 1950. And then when they ratified, they, they, they did it either with a view to foreign policy advantages uh, or treated compliance as a non issue. That, that uh, there was nothing in Sweden, for instance, that would need to change because they ratified the International Convention. So, turning then to the second phase here of this talk, the second episode here, uh, the idea of activism becomes more, more important. Uh, in the 1960s, Scandinavian governments began engaging in these activities that I mentioned before, in the, in, earlier in the talk, uh, uh, they escalated from policy activism in terms of uh, building up generous systems of development assistance, uh, extending their support for liberation movements and the struggle against the court, right? Uh, they engage in conflict uh, uh, mediation, peacekeeping, and so on. And while these efforts were rarely actually framed in terms of, of supporting human rights, the Scandinavian states also pioneered using the international human rights regime to promote human rights abroad. And that's when we come to the Greek case. I know there are people here who know the Greek case better than I do, but uh, for those who know, uh, uh, the story is that in April 1967, a military junta overthrows the democratic government in Greece. And as news spread about the junta's brutality, uh, the governments of Denmark, Norway, and Sweden filed identical interstate complaints against Greece with the Strasbourg Commission. And eventually, the Netherlands also joined this complaint. And the, the Commission on Human Rights in Strasbourg then appointed a committee which thoroughly investigated the claims about torture and concluded in April 1970 that Greece had violated its obligations under the European Commission on Human Rights. But already in December 1969, the Commons in Athens, which of course anticipated that this would result in their membership being suspended, uh, chose to withdraw Greece from the Council of Europe and then lambasted the Commission as a conspiracy of uh, communists and homosexuals against Hellenic values. Uh, the question is why did the Scandinavian governments confront the Greek junta? Uh, so, as I said earlier, some have suggested that they acted out of a cosmopolitan conviction that to, to act whenever the rights of fellow Europeans were being violated. But in fact, their motivations were much more complex and much more mixed. Uh, and the governments were very much divided on this issue, and, uh, uh, and the political parties in government were also internally divided, and there was, was a, a degree of conflict and conversation. Uh, initially, the Scandinavian government sort of maintained diplomatic dialogue with Greece, but uh, um, because of this division of the governments and the pressure by political parties, by support parties in parliament, by the mass media and by the civil society in the United States, they were 
they were successfully pushed to take a much tougher stance. Um, one of the issues at stake here for Denmark and Norway was the membership of the NATO, which was up for renewal in 1969. So they had entered with a 20 year membership and now they need to renew it. Um, the United States war in Vietnam and Portugal's colonial wars had created a lot of resistance against NATO in Denmark, and the way it calls for a referendum in Denmark uh, to leave NATO. And he had an image from, from, from uh, Oslo in Norway, where uh, the demonstration against the United States uh, with black power for a new United States, and of course, Norway out of NATO. So the governments of Norway and Denmark sought assurances that toppling a democratic government in a NATO member state violated the organization's fundamental values. But the dominant NATO powers prioritized keeping Greece as an ally here. So for the governments of the Scandinavian states, shifting forums from, from NATO to the Council of Europe uh, helped satisfy these domestic audiences and also distracted from the much more problematic issue of Greece's membership of the NATO. Uh, the Greek case has then been praised. It was the first time the states used an in-state complaint to protect the rights of citizens of another state. Uh, and it also helped place and torture on the agenda in the 1970s, and I will return to this later on. But an ironic consequence of the case was also that it showed that interstate complaints were a rather futile mechanism of enforcement. Uh, because the U European Convention system could, uh, couldn't do very much to prevent the state from backsliding into authoritarianism. And this had been one of the, had been one of the key motives for having the Convention of, uh, uh, on, on Human Rights uh, in the 19, in late 40s and then early 50s. The idea was that it would, would, would create an interstate pact against totalitarianism, against authoritarianism, and, 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 and to prevent uh, fascism and communism to, from returning. And the Greek case showed that no, interstate complaints uh, are not very efficient to do that. So, uh, uh, in that sense, the, the case was uh, disappointing. Uh, by the mid-1970s, uh, the idea of human rights had its real breakthrough in Indonesian politics, and the Scandinavian states were often early to commit when the regime expanded with new human rights treaties. So, encouraged by civil society and public opinion, the Scandinavian governments actively sponsored the drafting of uh, new human rights instruments, but they also sort of shape the new conventions after their human rights preferences. So for instance, when the Convention to End Discrimination Against Women uh, was being um, negotiated, Nordic delegates uh, together insisted that the convention should emphasize gender equality and child rearing, which of course is a Nordic uh, pet uh, issue, uh, and give civil society a prominent role in implementing the convention settings. Uh, Similarly, when the Convention on the Rights of the Child was being drafted in the 1980s, Scandinavian Scandinavian delegates promoted the notion of children as autonomous persons. They're not owned by their parents, they're not owned by the state, but they're actually autonomous persons that have rights. Uh, and these ideas, of course, reflected notions of gender equality or children's uh, uh, rights that were prevalent in Nordic society. But writing them into the conventions also meant that the Scandinavian states could ensure that their compliance with these conventions would then be rather smooth. They didn't have to change anything because the convention just reflected the values that they already had uh, enacted as policies in the Scandinavian states. And the Scandinavian states also contributed financial resources for international organs and conferences in the human rights area in this era. And they increasingly came to emphasize human rights in the foreign policies and in development aid policies. Uh, however, and I will try to do this with you. So, this is an era where the Scandinavian states are acting outwardly for human rights. They increasingly adopt human rights as a key motive in their foreign policies. Uh, but they also sort of control the consequence of this emerging national human rights regime for uh, domestic politics by mobilizing the doctrine of dualism. So, uh, so, Scandinavian legal systems were dominated at this time by, by the idea of Scandinavian legal realism which is a philosophy of law that basically sees rights talk as nonsense and international law as superstition and where, where judges and lawyers are seen as social engineers just operating the facts of the law and implementing the will of the legislature. It's a very pragmatic 
uh, legal philosophy that had been dominant in the Nordic countries from the 1930s and onwards in law schools. And, and students trained in this uh, took senior positions in, in the Justice Department when, when it expanded with the uh, with the mushrooming legislative activity of the welfare state. But from the, uh, so, so this provided some, some general protection against rights claims in Scandinavian countries, but governments also entrenched the doctrine of dualism. And dualism is, a, is a, an idea in international law on how to regulate the relationship between international law and domestic law. And uh, it, it basically says that uh, it requires a national mesh, international law regulations don't apply in domestic politics unless there's been some measure taken by parliament, government in the state that makes it applicable. Uh, so you can either transform, uh, either transformation or incorporation. So if an international human rights treaty, for instance, is not incorporated into domestic law, it doesn't matter much. It's, it's, it's basically irrelevant as a source of law in the domestic system. And uh, from the mid-1960s, policymakers became increasingly, increasingly concerned about this relationship between international law and domestic law in the Scandinavian states. Because the number of international organizations and treaties was rapidly increasing, and also they were uh, discussing whether to join the European Economic Community, what we today call the EU. Uh, and EEC law created a particular problems. It was very extensive, regulating so many areas of law. And in 1963 and 64, the European uh, Court of Justice, which is distinct from the Council of Europe's uh, court, this is the EU's court today. Uh, the, court, uh, uh, the European Court of Justice had declared that uh, EEC law was directly binding and supreme over national law. So Scandinavian governments then appointed expert commissions, which in coordination with another, one another Concluded in favour of continuing the dualist practice that we do. So, this provided a very convenient solution to the problem of international obligations. They don't apply unless we have incorporated these. So, they could quickly ratify new international human rights treaties uh, without uh, needing to fear any, any domestic repercussions of doing so. Uh, and in Sweden, in, in courts in the 1970s followed up these decisions by declaring themselves not formally bound by the European Court of Human Rights or its case law and also treated uh, law, international law treaties as virtually irrelevant for domestic law. The problem though with that was that uh, since governments standardly declared international human rights law treaties in harmony with national law when they ratified and since claimants increasingly started appealing to that claim of harmony between international law and domestic law Courts increasingly had to grapple with whether to treat the European Commission Human Rights and other human rights instruments as sources of law. And in the long run, dualism couldn't really shield the Nordic states from the common law of international human rights in the 1980s. So, uh, by the late days, Scandinavian states began realizing that their international human rights law commitments had more far-reaching domestic implications than they had assumed. As an increasingly activist uh, court, the European Court of Human Rights, delivered its first judgments finding Scandinavian states uh, in violation. And eventually they then incorporated the European Convention into domestic law, yet uh, try to prevent this from disturbing the domestic situation too much. And this is the facing look at the final phase here that leads us up to today. In 1982, the European Court of Human Rights for the first time found the Scandinavian state to have violated its obligations under the Convention in the case of Sprong and Lund versus Sweden. Uh, and I guess uh, this, is, this is like uh, Madison and Marbury or something called for Sweden, but very few people know about it. This is a joke that when, when visitors come to Stockholm for the first time or any other Swedish city, they ask, I mean, so was it severely destroyed in bombings during the war? Which, of course, Sweden was neutral during the war, so uh, Swedish cities weren't bombed, but this is, this is what Stockholm city centre looked like in the 1970s, because there was a huge plan of reconstructing basically the entire city centre and tearing down all classical buildings like this one and replacing them with modernist uh, uh, buildings and, and roads for cars throughout the entire city centre. And so the case of Sprung and Lundlund was initiated by a construction industry interest group which sought out suitable litigants to challenge 
what they saw as increasingly discretionary laws on expropriation and zoning in, uh, in Stockholm. And it concerned two property owners whose buildings in central Stockholm, as you see here, they are still standing, uh, maybe not because of the case, but uh, anyway. Uh, their buildings have been put under an extended expropriation permit, and the European Court of Human Rights found that since the claimants here uh, could not have the permits time limited, they couldn't claim compensation for the economic damage that they suffered due to these expropriation permits. I mean, if your building is under expropriation permits, you can't really, you, you're, you're not allowed to invest in it, you're not allowed to, uh, to renovate it. The place has no value because who would buy that building? So, so they, uh, and this went on for, for decades for these two uh, claimants. And so the court found that the state had violated the rights to peaceful enjoyment of property and to a fair trial. And this judgment received massive attention in the media and the numbers of individual applications against Sweden would then double every year. I will show you this nice slide from some more research. So what you have here is the number of individual applications per capita, so to speak, from Sweden and Norway. Uh, and please note that the scale is logarithmic, so it increases by a factor of 10 for every, uh, uh, every line here. Uh, and what happened after the Sporong and Lundup case was that uh, the numbers of cases doubled every year, as I said, and, and the government refused to comply with the judgment. So at the press conference in Strasbourg in 1983, uh, Prime Minister Rolf uh, Palme called the European Court of Human Rights a playhouse, and this expression was then picked up by the opposition in the Swedish Parliament. And, uh, only have raising public awareness about the European Convention on Human Rights. And as you can see here, it, it, it continues, Sweden continues to be sort of a, a problem child in the European Convention system after that, uh, generating more complaints than, than uh, on average from the other members of the Council. Uh, and the Minister of Justice also declared that there was no reason to believe that, that similar violations could occur and that there was no need, we need to change the law. So, the Commission in Strasbourg then thought, aha, here's a government that doesn't think that what we say matters, so let's look at other cases from Sweden. There's many applications coming in. And of course, they gave fine violations that there were problems with uh, the right to appeal administrative decisions in Sweden. Uh, so, even in case wanting evidence then that the Swedish system, legal system, fell short of European standards, the government only reluctantly introduced a temporary law that minimally extended the right to appeal administrative decisions. And soon, similar cases followed for Denmark and Norway as well. You can see the number of judgments, and some of these judgments then find the state to have violated at least uh, one uh, article of the Convention. And for uh, Denmark, the first case came in 1989, uh, in the Hauschild case, of a, uh, uh, and in, for Norway, in, the first case came in 1990, and since then, uh, there have been a number of cases as against the United States. Uh, to be fair though, uh, the increasing number of cases against Scandinavian states doesn't mean that Scandinavian states were getting worse in terms of human rights. It wasn't a junta taking, taking over Scandinavia uh, uh, and so on. Uh, it also had to do with the evolution of the European Convention system. As the court reinvented itself as a supranational constitutional court for mature European democracies. So, by the mid-1970s, most states in Western Europe had ratified the European Convention on Human Rights, they had accepted individual petition and their jurisdiction of the court. And the original bench at Strasbourg gave way to a new generation of judges uh, and relaunching itself as a progressive force for human rights in Europe. The court also develops a doctrine of dynamic interpretation, that is the idea to see the convention as a living instrument in step with societal developments. And, of course, what also happened was that waves of democratization rolled over Southern Europe, over Eastern Europe, uh, and the Council of Europe evolved from a small club of like-minded countries into an international organization that promoted the dem democratization and the rule of law of these states. And many of these states had recent experiences of authoritarian rule, and of course, saw the European Commission system as a way to safeguard their democratic transitions. So, uh, 
Another issue that I would look at here is uh, the incorporation then of the European Commission rules. And the possibility here is why. So, Scandinavian states have just been found in violation of the Commission. They realized that the convention that they ratified back in 1950 or 1953 uh, wasn't just an empty promise, it actually had consequences for the domestic systems. And then, only a few years later, they decide to incorporate the Convention. Why, why, this, why this strange idea that the Convention that just has proved itself to be costly, why would it bind yourself even more tightly to it by incorporating the Convention into national law? Uh, this is a complex background, but some of the key parts here was that many key actors in, in the domestic system saw a need to clarify the European Convention of Human Rights in national law. So courts increasingly found themselves having to consider the Convention a source of law, because litigants made claims by referring to the European Convention of Human Rights, and then courts had to figure out what the government's declaration that domestic law is in harmony with the European Convention, what, what does that really mean? But more decisive was probably a backdrop of major geopolitical upheaval, economic recession, and shifts in government. So, the detente during the Cold War allowed the Scandinavian states uh, to reorient their, themselves toward Europe even, even more. So, and this question of, of the rapprochement between Scandinavia and, and the European community made the status of the European Convention of Human Rights in domestic law even more inconsistent. So when the European Community formed the Single European Act in 1987, members of the EFTA, the European Free Trade uh, Association, uh, risked facing new trade barriers. So Denmark was already in the EC, but Sweden and Norway is part of the EFTA with some other states. Uh, so, led by Sweden then, the EFTA states uh, sought closer collaboration with uh, the European community by establishing the European Economic Area. Uh, eventually, Sweden and Norway were also preparing to join the European community, uh, but already the EEA agreement would oblige them to accept the European community's uh, uh, law, their keys, communitaire. And, interesting, in a series of judgments, the European Court of Justice had ruled that fundamental rights uh, were general principles of EC law, as they were recognized in the constitutions of the member states and the treaties that they had ratified, specifically the European Convention on Human Rights. So the question was not really whether or not to incorporate the European Convention on Human Rights, but as the Danish Inquiry Commission noted, whether incorporation should be extended to those areas of law uh, that are not regulated wholly or partly by EC law. So, so here the United States accept the considerable costs of incorporating the Commission into the domestic legal system uh, because it's outweighed by the much greater benefits of political influence and access to trade and, and, and so on in the European community. Uh, so they simply trade rights against uh, influence and, and economic benefits. Uh, but there was key opposition uh, uh, against uh, incorporations in Sweden. You have the Social Democratic Party that stuck to the social, uh, the dualist policy of the 1970s and dismissed conservative motions on incorporation in the late 1980s. And so the conservatives, who had been out of power so much, of course, they, they saw not only they were European friendly or something, but they also saw the, the Commission as a way of binding future governments. And so the, after the 1999 election, the built government on incorporation. In, the, in Norway, uh, the opposition again, there was not so much between political parties as between the, uh, the Justice Ministry and the, and the Foreign Ministry, where, where the Justice Ministry and the Attorney General uh, strongly resisted incorporation, even after there had been a proposal. So it would take finally a government shift, even in Norway, for uh, the uh, decision to incorporate actually to take place in 1999. And cautious to preserve control and not to undermine uh, the supremacy of the parliaments, the governments instructed the national courts to show self restraints in interpreting the Convention. Now, that was not really good. But here you can see uh, also uh, how late they were in terms of incorporating. So, this is the time from, from signing the European Commission in Rights to incorporating it. And the Scandinavian states and Iceland are only beaten by the UK and Ireland in terms of late incorporators of the European Commission. 
So, course was supposed to be uh, showing self restraint in the pilot convention, but uh, uh, as this graph here shows, uh, they have had to uh, successively look much more into European emerging human rights issues. Uh, this is from the uh, Norwegian Supreme Court. And as you can see here, uh, the proportion of cases having to do with European Convention on Human Rights or the case law of the European Court of Human Rights has increased steadily uh, since uh, the mid-1990s. And for the Scandinavian governments, the costs of complying with international human rights law has continued to grow. Um, one reason for that is that in civil society, groups and organizations have increasingly made use of expanding opportunities for legal organizational rights, representing a wide range of courses. So I will show you some of these examples here. So this is from, from Stockholm, and those who have been in Stockholm might recognize the site here where they're standing. Does anyone know where they're standing? If someone is a, uh, this is a tourist site here, it's the Royal Castle down here, but the, the, the Swedish Parliament is on the other side, basically. They're facing the Swedish Parliament. So. Uh, and they're demonstrating, uh, this, this is uh, a demonstration against compulsory sterilization of uh, people wishing to have uh, uh, transgender surgery, uh, or sexual and surgery. Uh, and they are protesting and appealing to the politicians to change this, this uh, uh, law that uh, made sterilization mandatory to have this kind of surgery. Uh, it, however, it was a court that would eventually uh, um, remove this, this uh, requirement before Parliament actually had the right to change the legislation. This is one, one example of this type of litigation. Here's another famous case from Norway where uh, Greenpeace and Nature and Youth uh, sued the Norwegian state over oil drilling concessions in, in, the, uh, uh, in the Arctic, uh, arguing that they violate the constitutional rights to the environment. And this, this, I think, is still a long case that you sued or something. Uh, and here's another case uh, that I'm looking to in my research uh, of two midwives, Linda Steel or Eleanor Kuma, you understand me? So, who were denied employment by the, by the, by the region, uh, by, by the hospital, because they refused to participate in performing abortions. Uh, and they went through the Swedish court system claiming the right to uh, freedom of conscience and freedom of religion, but uh, were denied this right in the Swedish system. Now they have filed a complaint with the European Court of Human Rights, and it's, it's pending there, and I think we'll have a decision on whether it will be tried or not soon. Uh, some groups have, in both Sweden and Norway, which share a some population, uh, uh, have been uh, using lawsuits to uh, claim land rights. But of course, for all these groups, it's the sum included, the point of purpose with litigation courses is not only to actually win a case, but also to bring attention to your issues and so on, to, 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 to coalesce the movement or, or, or to um, uh, get recognition and, uh, 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 from, from the Swedish state that has violated their rights for so long. Uh, so these are, these are examples of how governments incur increasing compliance costs. Uh, it's not a case from Sweden where Roma groups sued the Swedish state uh, after it turned out that the Swedish, uh, that the police force had illegal, illegal registers of, uh, that, that registered people's ethnic identity uh, as Roma. Uh, so, uh, what, uh, sorry. Uh, what has happened is that uh, uh, the demands for domestic invitation have also increased in, in recent years. Uh, the responsibility for uh, implementing human rights laws changed in the 19, since the mid-1990s, where uh, the responsibility diffused from ministers and parliaments chiefly to involve numerous public authorities and regional and local municipalities. So now you will have a human rights policy at the municipal level. You will have uh, seminars about how to ensure the human rights of elderly people in elderly care, for instance, which was not an issue in the late 80s, uh, to be sure. And whereas international treaty bodies once used to treat Scandinavian states as models to others, they have become increasingly critical in their ever more extensive reviews of domestic practices. Sweden was often 
what was literally said to be a role model for, for, for others in terms of its, uh, its uh, penal practices, but now is getting criticism for the refusal, for instance, to criminalize torture in domestic law or to incorporate the uh, Convention Against Torture. So, growing awareness that international human rights commitments can entail substantial compliance costs has also made Scandinavian states more reluctant to expand their commitments to international human rights law. They still pride themselves on being human rights pioneers, but in practice they often assume more, a, more, a much more cautious attitude towards new international human rights treaties. Uh, for instance, in the process of drafting the third optional protocol to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, this is a protocol that establishes uh, complaint mechanisms uh, for, for children. Um, uh, uh, in, in the process of doing that, the Norway refused to participate, whereas Sweden took a very skeptical attitude. Uh, and governments also routinely resist ratifying optional protocols that establish complaints mechanisms so as not to restrict the national direction, as you can see here, uh, from some of these protocols here. Uh, in Denmark, successive governments have shelved proposals to incorporate further international human rights treaties into the domestic law. Uh, arguing that it entails a uh, uh, quote, risk of displacing competence from Parliament to the courts. Uh, Norway ratified the ILO 169 on indigenous and, people, uh, and tribal people's rights already in 1990, but when Sweden, which also has an indigenous population, saw the difficulties in complying with the Convention, because it grants land rights to people up north where there is mining and forestry interest and so on. Sweden has uh, 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 resisted the ratifying the ILO law system. So, uh, to conclude then, uh, if we look back at the shift from ambivalence uh, via, via activism that was enabled by dualism to ambivalence again, it seems hard to account for this in purely cultural terms. Scandinavian governments and other actors have been much more strategic in their commitment to international human rights law than the culturalist account would suggest. So they cautiously sought to prevent the Council of Europe from creating a strong supranational human rights regime and ratifying it with precautions. Uh, and while they expanded the foreign policy activism in the 1960s and 70s, uh, including in the human rights area, they simultaneously mobilized the doctrine of dualism that serve as a bulwark against international law and allow them to ratify any human rights treaty that came their way. And once the international human rights regime began having a domestic impact since the 1980s, uh, they have become much more reluctant to expand the international human rights regime because they now know that their promises are consequential at home rather than just empty promises. But what I have talked about here is mostly motivations. What is driving them, the Scandinavian states, when, when grappling with commitments to international human rights laws? So, in motivations or intentions and so on is one thing, effects is a quite different thing. Uh, and some have argued that the Greek case was a, a, a failure. It did little to prevent the coup in Greece, and the case never reached the Strasbourg court, since Greece had not accepted its jurisdiction. And already in December 1969, the Junta uh, had withdrawn from the Council of Europe because it anticipated its suspension. And uh, on some accounts, oppression only worsened after Greece's exit from the Council of Europe. And while the Junta was apparently disturbed by the criticism, uh, its relations to Western Europe soon normalized. Uh, but in the longer term, you can say that the Greek case did have important consequences. So the Commission's report uh, uh, on Greece was the first time ever that an international human rights body established that a state had practiced torture. And subsequently, the case contributed to putting torture on the international agenda in the 1970s, especially after the military coup in Chile in 1973. And Sweden, allied with NGOs such as Amnesty International, initiated the United Nations Declaration Against Torture in 1975 and eventually the Convention Against Torture, which uh, entered into force in 1987. 
and the Council of Europe also uh, would establish the European Convention for the Prevention of Torture in 1987, uh, which has a committee that is authorized to make in situ inspections. Uh, and it's also a committee that regularly visits Sweden and is supported by the, uh, by the use of solitary confinement in Swedish women prisons. So, but that's another story. The irony, however, is that by their high-minded defense of human rights in the Greek case, the Scandinavian governments also accorded the Council of Europe system, the Strasbourg human rights system, an authority that their citizens would eventually turn against themselves. So in that way, the case also contributed to changing the scale of states' domestic human rights practices. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivan. This was really, really interesting, and uh, I can honestly say that I have changed some of my views on my, <laughs> on my own country. There were many things that I, I had assumed that uh, certainly were not, uh, do not seem to be true. Uh, I am sure that there are some questions and comments, and I open up for them right now. And should I perhaps take the microphone? Oh, you can turn on the other one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I have and it's related to the, the graph that we saw. Yes. There was another peak around 2010. Uh, what, yes. what peak is that? That's good. Uh, yes, yeah, that's a good question. And I honestly don't quite know the answer to that because uh, uh, I've sourced the data for this graph from yearbooks of the European Commission system. And they can see what the applications are about. And in order to see that, you would have to go to Strasbourg and actually see and look through their archive what is it that people are applying for. It. But my guess and my hunch here is that it has to do with uh, taxation cases in Sweden, where there was a practice where, where someone who had been, uh, been found uh, in violation of the tax code would both have a punishment and would have tax surcharge. And this was then in violation of the Nebis and Eden principle, they, the, the principle that you can't be punished twice for the same crime. Uh, and there were a number of cases in, in Sweden on this, and they tried to turn to the European Court of Justice on this as well, and also to the European Court of Human Rights, probably. Uh, and eventually there was actually an uprising by, by district courts in Sweden against the practice of the Swedish Supreme Court that eventually overturned this policy in Sweden, so that... Uh, and uh, that will explain the justice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So probably uh, the great number of cases here are uh, having to uh, have to do with the uh, tax uh, tax cases, um, uh, which uh, uh, is of course something that affects a lot of citizens as well. So I would explain why why it's uh, this shop slightly. And what happened in in, uh, uh, in Norway in around 2000? I also don't know what this, why, why there's a spike there because we can't see from the data why. What would it contain? Uh, yes. Yes. I, uh, I have a question to ask. I'm guessing also that there might be um, an ideological reason behind the reluctance to uh, support the court and uh, all these judicial mechanisms. So I was, I, w I would like to ask, what was the, the Nordic state's stance about the European Social Charter and social rights? Were they more enthusiastic about it and the collective complaints procedure? Do you happen to know anything about this? Uh, I haven't looked into that specifically, so I can only, again, I can only guess uh, uh, an answer there. But uh, from the point of view, point of, view of Scandinavia, uh, the whole idea of European social rights is uh, often seen as a threat and a problem uh, because uh, of the impression that we have a different system for ensuring social rights. Uh, so, for instance, uh, yeah. So, so, so there has been, been uh, yeah. I, I think that, I, 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 that, that's what I'd say in order not to say something that's not true. But, uh, 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 but my, my, there has been quite some skepticism towards the idea of, of ensuring social rights at the European level uh, in the Scandinavian states. Uh, 
Uh, and of these, from I mean, uh, so you, you might think that that uh, social democratic parties would be very much in favour of that because I mean they're the pro social equalisation and so on. But the the model for ensuring social benefits and social rights and so on in the Scandinavian states is quite different from from a rights based one. So it's based on, for instance, having very strong trade unions that can negotiate with strong employers organizations so that the state can take, take a step back. So it's this form of less fair corporate. We have strong corporations that, that make a deal, basically. It's like a bargain. So it's a collective bargain and not something that is legislated by the state. So something that surprises people in other European states is that we, for instance, don't have a, a, a law on minimum wages in, in Sweden. It's up to the trade unions to negotiate with the trade with the employers of that. So, and the state uh, sort of uh, can just back. Uh, and the idea of, of uh, introducing rights that are being justiciable in courts is, of course, a fundamental challenge to the corporate system where, where power will move, maybe not from parliaments and governments, but from trade unions and employers associations to uh, other actors. And so, for instance, in, in, in Denmark, I know that uh, employers organizations uh, were very much skeptical of using litigation, for instance, because they feel that they are much more in, they're in a much safer position when they can negotiate directly with the trade unions rather than having to go through courts and having to pay expensive law firms for their services. And so. But that's a roundabout of an answer, but uh, 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 since I haven't looked uh, specifically at that area. It confirms my assumption because what you said earlier is it's also about the Viking case in the European court. So it, it's pretty much the same. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting lecture. I just thought I wanted to uh, explain this peak in Norway uh, around the mid and uh, late 90s. Uh, it was the law on religious education in schools that was changed. And, uh, uh, and the idea was to change it from kind of the, 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 the religious education of the church integrated in the school system and into more kind of information about religion, including Christianity. Um, and, and this was in order to keep the, the education, the groups together. Um, and all the, all the educational books on this was changed, um, like the, the books for use in schools. But then parents thought that, well, you know, this still uh, either there is too much preaching for this religion or for that religion and um, so it was about all the secular humanists who felt that uh, their religions were described in a too kind of positive way uh, so uh, so they took these cases to Strasbourg um, there is going to be another peak now uh, because uh, and it has to do with what you say about the autonomous perception of the child that we have in Scandinavia, so uh, so it's a question of when when the, the 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 public service can intervene when they think a child is not treated well enough, and uh, apparently now there are twenty one. The first case has been won on behalf of the of the mother, and then there are apparently twenty cases in line. So this is also going to be another peak. Um, but I just wanted to ask you if I understood you correctly. So you said, or what, your, the, the, what you argue is that in the beginning the Scandinavian states were kind of very positive to all of this because it in a way, uh, it was a kind of a value imperialism that they could kind of spread <laughs> through uh, the system to, uh, they didn't need to adjust very much, but as there are more and more conventions, they need to do much more to comply. And so they are more reluctant. Is that kind of the gist of your argument? Well, I would say uh, my my point was that when, when the European Convention on Human Rights uh, was founded, in, 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 well, drafted and founded in, in, in 1950, and then ratified by the by the states, uh, the Scandinavians were skeptical and, and, and were reluctant to participate in this whole project, and they sort of minimized. But then, uh, as the regime expanded in the 1970s with new conventions and, and in the 1980s. Uh, they could participate more actively uh, and they could ratify more quickly because they were protected by the doctrine of rulers. So they knew that uh, when the state ratifies the treaty, it won't have direct consequences. So if the state is a lonely state instead, it means that 
the treaties that the state ratifies are directly uh, um, applicable within the state. Uh, and most other states in Europe are monists. Uh, but the Scandinavian states uh, held uh, on to this notion of dualism and that allowed them to uh, be more active in the English human rights sphere than they might otherwise have been because they could act on the presumption that uh, their conventions were ratified or not applicable in the domestic system. It's the rights of others. It's, we are doing this to promote rights elsewhere. It's not about Scandinavia, it's not about I mean, the Commission of the Rights of the Child, it's just, it's we, we all live there. We, we, we safeguard the rights of our children, and I'm going to teach others how to do this themselves. I think that's something that's very strong in the Scandinavian and Norwegian, and maybe also the English self perception that, that we were the first countries in the world to ban spanking of children and so on, uh, and now let's export that to others. Uh, uh, but the thing is that there, I mean, there are increasingly an awareness now that, that also the um, the obligations that the Scandinavian states have on the Commission on the Rights of the Child have important repercussions to Mexico. And so in Sweden, the debate is doing now on the um, coming incorporation of the Commission on the Rights of the Child and how that disturbs some practices that are, are prevalent in Sweden. For instance, child removal cases and such, which are now the most big issue in the world. Axel? Um, I'm well, I thought it was interesting to put the Greek case in the perspective uh, from a Scandinavian point of view. Uh, but I think that you could maybe lose uh, some important uh, elements of the Greek case's specificity. And I want to point out, make two points there. Uh, the first is that from a Greek democratic perspective, I don't think that uh, case in the Council of Europe was a short-term failure. It was one of the biggest successes uh, in, uh, of the Greek resistance uh, towards the, and therefore uh, in Greece, and when I say Greece I also, uh, including the left wing uh, beyond social level, the communist resistance, uh, they didn't see any ambivalence in the position of the Scandinavian countries. Because remember in 69, what had happened? We had Nixon in America who fully legitimized the junta. We had the Brits who were yes and no. The French were normalizing. The Eastern countries had started normalization. And just then, the Council of Europe kicks out in practice because they, they retired because they were to be kicked out. So in, in Greece, the three countries and the Netherlands uh, were in very high esteem. That's the one. Now, from a, a Swedish, let's say, because I happened to be in Sweden at that time, I think we should have take, there are very important internal political elements. Remember the public opinion in Sweden. And at that time there were two movements, Vietnam and uh, Greece. Vietnam was dominated by the communists. And indeed not even the communist party, by the Maoists, with the Khoi Fenmel and the, uh, so the, uh, the Social Democrat government was ambiguous to Vietnam, despite Palmer's uh, statements. They didn't like that much because they were drawn too, too far. Greece was ideal for them. They had Papandreou. The Greeks, including the communists, were much more moderate than the Vietnamese. So they invested uh, on Greece uh, to show the good conscience of Sweden and all that, of course. And I believe there is a similarity also in other countries. So uh, th this dimension of, uh, uh, of, let's say, the public opinion which played the role at the time and, uh, is important, I think, at least for Sweden. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for, for adding that. Uh, and, uh, uh, I'm sorry that I maybe paid too little attention to the Greek case in the talk. Uh, 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 in the talk as such, but, uh, and, and you were right, I mean, uh, uh, my, my point was rather that it was a short term failure for the Council of Europe that contributed to the reorientation of the European Convention system in the 1970s. So, so when, the, when the European Convention of Human Rights was founded, it was, part of the motivation was that it would provide an 
an interstate pact against totalitarianism. To, it would prevent state from backsliding into dictatorship or, or, uh, and so on. And, and some of the most supportive members of it were the European states that had, I mean, of course, recent experience of the, of the war, but also recent experience of, of fascism, uh, and saw this as an insurance against uh, uh, backsliding and a protection of democracy and the rule of law. And what the case showed was that when this actually happened, when the European state backslides into the petition, uh, the Commission can't prevent that uh, for many reasons. And then uh, what we also seen is that the, 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 uh, the interstate complaints mechanism was not ideal for those purposes, because when states file interstate complaints mechanisms or otherwise take international action for human rights, there are so many other things that go into the equation. So they, uh, they, you know, you have to mix it up with all the other kind of means of influence you have. And, so and it's very difficult to get states that contract. So there have been very few interstate complaints since. But what happened in the 1970s is that uh, the idea of what the convention was about shifted. You know? So it's okay. It's not about preventing backsliding into dictatorship. It's about reforming stable, consolidated European rule of law states. We can use this convention as a quasi-constitution or bill of rights for Europe for the mature, stable, democratic states. And uh, in, in, in step with societal developments, uh, improve the rule of law standards in the member states. And that is something that the Scandinavian states have probably not foreseen in the 1950s when they ratified. They, they never saw that coming, and no one else either. Um, but that's also why the, uh, the Spolong London case, for instance, in the 1980s, was such, such a surprise and disappointment for them. Do we have any more questions? Yeah, please. Uh, I